And then, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. No, uh, Jesus paid it all. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see these lovely smiling faces. And those that aren't smiling, it's still good to see you. Amen. It's good to be in God's house. And uh, how many of y'all recovering from yesterday? Still? I'm still recovering. Amen. Bill is out there. and Barbara. Well, I know Barbara and Doyle working on the house getting ready for his mama coming. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, it's good to have y'all here this morning. Let's stand, if y'all will, if you're able, hymn number 363, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. And as tired as we were last night, I'm sure many of us were doing a lot of that, just leaning on something. Amen. Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. <laughs> Amen. Here we go on the first. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all of Leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day. Leaning on the everlasting arms. On a chorus. Leaning on Jesus. Leaning on Jesus. Safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus. Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Here we go on that last one now. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. Blessed peace with my Lord so near. On the everlasting arms, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarm. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. It's good to have somebody we can lean on, isn't it? Somebody that we can lean on in times of trouble and uh, things that come our way and we get discouraged. We have somebody we can lean on and his name is Jesus Christ and praise the Lord for that. It's good to see y'all here this morning. I'm going to ask Dull if he'll open us up in a word of prayer, please. Father. Amen. All right. Hymn number 219, 219, Jesus paid it all. And it costs us nothing. But to live for him will cost us something. 219, Jesus paid it all. Here we go on the first. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. 
Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow on the third for nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's lamb Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow all right last chance to sing this song on this verse today and when before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow amen how many are glad for that this morning sin can leave a dark ugly dirty stain but the blood of Christ can cleanse it amen all right, while y'all are standing, we'll go ahead and do our theme verse for 2021. This is May 2nd. We're already the fifth month into 2021, Connie. 1 John 2, 28. And now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. 1 John 2, 28. Amen. Y'all go ahead and be seated. And Bethany, I just got one question. Where's your yellow bow? <laughs> I was looking at Bethany and Julie, and they're dressed up the same, except Julie's got a yellow bow, a bow in her hair, and Bethany don't have one, so she said hers flew out the window. <laughs> amen amen it's good to see y'all i'll tell you what we had a wonderful turnout yesterday i want to thank each and every one of you that that came and and had your part in what we did yesterday we had 22 people uh not that we're counting people but we did have about 22 only reason we know that is because we had to order enough pizza for everybody but uh we had 22 people that came yesterday and then uh one that showed up just a little bit later than others did. I'm not going to mention Aiden's name, so that, that way nobody <laughs> would be called out on that. But it was good to see fresh blood come after uh, what we had already done. Uh, but I'll tell you what, we got a lot done. The front of the church looks good. If you want to see it via picture, Brother Randy had taken pictures and uh, posted them on Facebook. And uh, Connie told me this morning, I, I don't get on Facebook a lot, but she said that... Uh, as of this morning, what time did you put those pictures on, Randy? Uh, 8 about 8 45, 9 o'clock last night. And by this morning, we had one section where 69 people had already viewed. And uh, he did it twice. And a second one where like 61 people had viewed it. So, you know, praise the Lord, man. I'll tell you what, uh, I was all, your pastor was, he's not a Facebook person and this, that, and the other, but we're reaching people. And uh, praise the Lord for that. And uh, again, I just want to thank y'all. Thank y'all very much for those that came. No matter how small of a part you think you might have played, it, it helped. And I want to thank each and every one of you. And not only that, there were some that gave financially so that we were able to do what we did yesterday. And I want to thank those uh, that gave financially and, and uh, supported us through that way. You know, it all comes together all for the glory of God. Amen. Even though your pastor couldn't get his chainsaw started, that was embarrassing. And uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, we won't say that online. 
we won't say that. Yes, I did drive a Chevy. We did drive a, I did. And Brother Randy drove a Ram, and he did say the Ram was better. <laughs> now, Miss Becky, that's where I ask God to forgive me of what I said. Amen. All right, real quick, let me, let me run through some announcements, but just no church, no matter what part you played in it, even if you were praying and you weren't here and you prayed for us, thank you very much for yesterday. It looks awesome what we've done out there, and, and I just appreciate it. Yeah, there's still more to come. We cleared out this brush stuff right here, and Connie looked at it this morning and said, you know what? We could probably put a picnic shelter there. So she's already thinking ahead. So oh, it never ends. Never ends. And I'm glad it keeps us young. Right, Julie? Look, Julie probably went home and passed out, didn't she? Bless her heart. She, he's, and I'll be honest, if I may, uh, adults, I want to brag on the young people a little bit. I want to brag on them. I'll tell you what, Archer and Jacob and Jocelyn and... and even Aiden, when he showed up, man, and I, and I don't want to leave any of the young people out, but boy, I'll tell you what, they were, Isaiah, yep, and Skylar, they were here yesterday. You know, we've got a good group of young people, and praise the Lord for them, and we need to continue to pray for our young people, amen? They were out there moving wheelbarrows, and I even let a couple of them drive my Ram truck, and they said, boy, I'm going to get me a Ram truck. No, they didn't say that. <laughs> I need to stop. Amen. All right, just real quick, a couple of announcements, if I may. June, Dr. Yoho is coming. Dr. Yoho is a professor at Tabernacle Baptist Bible College. And if you have not had an opportunity or the privilege to meet Dr. Yoho yet, you're in for a treat. Dr. Yoho, he's kind of different in his delivery, if you will, but the message that he brings is, is a powerful message. Um, and he's got a memory better than an elephant. Uh, I'll tell you, I've never seen somebody that has a memory like what he has. But he is going to be with us in June. We're going to have a Bible conference uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, he is going to have a Bible conference on the minor prophets. Uh, the way I like to, when I was uh, memorizing the 66 books of the Bible, you break those 66 books up into categories, and it's easier to remember that. And you, you have your, uh, they call them the major prophets, not because they're any better than the minor prophet. It's just that the major prophets' books are larger uh, than the minor prophets. So you have uh, um, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel are the major prophets. And then you have the prophets like Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Habakkuk Zephaniah, Haggai. Those are the minor prophets, and that's where he's going to spend uh, his uh, time on when he comes and does the Bible conference on the minor prophets. So he suggested that before he comes, that if you could get a copy of a book that would help when he does uh, discuss the minor prophets. And uh, the name of the book is the minor prophets. Um, there is a sign up sheet in the foyer that if you would like a copy of this book, I am asking that you put your name how many copies you want. I've already ordered mine and Connie, so it's supposed to be here Wednesday, and so I'm, we get a head start before y'all do. But uh, if you would like this book, what I am asking is that if you want one, you put your name down, you just give the, the payment to the church because the church will order these books in one lump quantity, and it's $20 if you want the book. I would tell you the church is going to pay for it, but if we do that, a lot of times if we're given something for free, we're not going to respect it as much, and we might not read it because, hey, I didn't pay for this book, so I'm not going to read it. So between you and God, if you want a copy of this book and you want to pay for it, just give the payment to the church. Okay, $20, just give the $20 to the church, and then we will order the books that way you'll have them before Dr. Yoho comes, give you an opportunity to read it and get an idea of what he's going to teach about. So let me encourage you to do that. If you want a copy of the book, put your name, how many you want on the list in the foyer. Amen? Amen. Yes. Oh, no, I don't. I can, I can look at it real quick. The last name, I can't remember the name of the author. 
You know, and I thought of getting the author's name, and I'm like, nah, nobody's going to ask me that. And then what happens? Ah, good point. Very good. Yes, yes. Very good point. Where am I going? Email. So I can look at the receipt. Bam, there it is. Uh, just bear with me. It is. It's coming up. Okay, I clicked on my... There it is. Uh, the author... Come on. It is Charles Feinberg. The author is Charles, C-H-A-R-L-E-S, Feinberg, F-E-I-N-B-E-R-G. Charles Feinberg. Here's a copy. Uh, here's what it looks like. It's a green book. I still bought it anyway, even though green's not my color. But Charles Feinberg, The Minor Prophets, if you're online and you want to get it, uh, it is on Amazon. Those, I don't know, people might not like Amazon, but that's all right. Get it wherever you get your books in. Amen. So Charles Feinberg, the Minor Prophets, and uh, it's not required for it. So don't think that if you don't want the book, you can't come to the conference. Because I know Dr. Yoho, he's going to have notes. He'll have notes for you. I know Dr. Yoho, he will have notes. And he uh, will make those available. So uh, please plan on coming. It is the third weekend in June, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, I, I believe you'll, you'll, you're in for a blessing. Also, the second thing that I would like to announce, um, I would like to replace our hymn books. Okay. Uh, Byron, how many of y'all know Byron Fox? Byron Fox has a ministry to music. He sells hymnal books. As a matter of fact, a lot of times if you go to independent Baptist churches, you're going to see his hymn books in the pews. Um, so what we would like to do, um, he has a quote unquote, a scratch and dent department uh, for these books and they're $11.95 a piece. Or if we buy them new, it's $13.99. I'm looking at getting about 85 uh, song books. We can have th uh, two per holder for each pew so that you know opportunity for everybody to have it now the total cost uh before taxes if we go with the 1990 is 1190 90 dollars suggestion was brought up that if you as a family or even as an individual would like to buy a book in memory of somebody or if you want to just contribute to the hymnals we want to give you an opportunity to do that as well but i like the idea that if you want to buy one in memory of somebody maybe you want to buy two or three in memory of somebody we'll make sure that inside the book that this this hymnal was purchased in memory of the individual and uh but if you would like to do that and you want to give to that uh brother doyle and dean when you do the offering we'll make a special section for the hymn books and uh, if you want to do that, whether check or in the envelope, write on their hymnal. And then uh, if you want to, in memory of somebody, just put that person's name and uh, we'll make sure that gets put in the hymnals. So that's what I would like to do. I, the church, uh, the ones that I've talked to are in agreement with that. Um, so if you want to donate to that, please do so. Write a check out for the church or whatever. Put in hymnal uh, in remembrance of somebody. Amen. Yes, that are not in this. There's a lot of hymns that we know that aren't in here. And uh, I like the old hymns. And by the way, listen, I'm speaking of singing. I'm putting, I, I've got so many things running through my head that I want to preach to you all. And one of the things that I want to preach is rock and roll music and the evil of rock and roll music. And look, I'm not getting a lot of amens on that, but that's okay. Satan was the leader of music in heaven and satan has a lot of influence over young people in the music that is being played and i think preachers today need to preach of the evils of the rock and roll music because it's leading astray now amen brother amen amen country we sing praises to our lord and savior jesus christ through hymns amen i'm not in even I'm not even in the rock and roll hymns. To me, that don't make no sense. That's being worldly. We're to come out from among them. You know, a lot of churches sound like they're having a, a 
a rock concert going on, even though they're singing. It, exactly. And listen, and I love y'all, and I want, I want to preach truth to you. And listen, I'm not going to be afraid of man. If it offends anybody, that's your fault. I'm going to preach the truth. I'm going to preach what the Bible says. And I believe Satan is behind it all. And we're going to do a little series on Satan because I'm gearing up to something. I'm going to be gearing up to something. And it goes back to a question Dean had asked about aliens and extraterrestrials. And believe it or not, I'm going to start with Satan. And we're going to work up to that, okay? I listened to a message this week. I told Connie, and she kind of like, I said, I think I believe in UFOs now. But not, hold on. I'm, this is a teaser. But not in the essence of what the world thinks that it is. I believe it's demonic activity. I believe it's demonic activity. But anyway, I'm not preaching on that. I need to go on. <laughs> Amen. But listen, we're called to proclaim the truth. Amen. The truth. And that's what we're going to do. And I'm not going to be one of these wishy-washy uh, pansy preachers that get in the pulpit and just tell you how good you are. Because we ain't good and we need to learn this book. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother Bill, come and sing for us, man, before I get to preaching. Brother Bill is going to come and do a special for us this morning. Amen. Is this on? Yeah. You know, the, the scripture says somewhere in Paul's writings that let him that is merry sing songs. So I'm glad for an opportunity uh, to sing a song because I consider myself merry. <laughs> um, okay. Beulah Land, sweet Beulah Land, I'm kind of home, sick for a country to which I've never been before no sad goodbyes will there be spoken for time won't matter anymore Beulah land I'm longing for you and some
There we go. All right, Acts 23, chapter, or Acts chapter 23 and verse 10. Woo! You know, it's good to be saved. When you look at all what's going on around in this world, and boy, just that song that Brother Bill sang, that one day we're going to be at our home and it's eternal. We'll always be there. God will be our God. Oh man, I'll tell you what, what a, what a, what a, what a joy it is to know that we're saved and on our way to heaven. Acts chapter 23, we're going to look at two verses, 10 and 11, and no, chapter 23, chapter 23, and uh, verse number 10, we'll just read verse 10 and 11, and uh, preach a message this morning entitled, Just When I Need Him Most. Well, I'll tell you what, we have times in our lives that you know, we wonder if we're going to even make it through the day. Things happen. We can't control circumstances around us, can we? Things are going to happen, whether they be good or whether they be bad. Understand in the fallen world that we live in, things are uncertain. But listen, there are times that Jesus is going to be there just when we need him most. Amen. And we're going to look at an incident in the life of Paul uh, where Jesus was with Paul when he needed him the most. Acts chapter 23, verse number 10. And when there arose a great disp uh, when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Father, we thank you for your word that's forever settled in heaven. Help us to, uh, Lord, be hearers of your word. Help us to be students of your word. And then most importantly, help us to be doers of your word. Father, I want to thank you for this a uh, lovely group of, of people that we have in, in your house this morning. Father, thank you for their faithfulness being here. And Father, I'm sure that each and every one of them has special needs in their lives. And Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them and let them know that, Father, you're with them. And Lord, you're there to comfort them. You're there to help them. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be at work. And Lord, if by chance there's one in our midst that doesn't know you as Savior, that, Lord, before it's eternally too late, they'll come to know you as their personal Savior. Thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we ask it all, and amen. Uh, just real quick, by way of background understanding what's going on here, Paul, of course, up to this point, he has, he has finished his three missionary journeys. One of the greatest missionaries that walked this earth was the Apostle Paul, was, was a great missionary. And the Apostle Paul, now here as we pick up our text, is where some Christians in his day felt that he should not go. He is in Jerusalem. He is now back where he started when he was persecuting Christians. He is back where he was when he was killing Christians. He had already completed his three missionary trips. Now he has a burden, he has a heart's desire to witness and to see the Jews come to know Jesus as uh, their personal Savior. So he goes back to Jerusalem, and guess what happens while he's at Jerusalem? He is arrested for preaching the gospel. He is arrested. Uh, uh, and now, as we pick it up here in, in verse 10, he was standing before the council. Okay, the council, the Sanhedrin council for the Jews was made up of two groups of people. They were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees was the religious uh, uh, sect of that time. And uh, Paul himself was a Pharisee at one time. Understand the Pharisees were the conservatives of the group. Uh, the Sanhedrins were the liberals of the group. Uh, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. But the Sadducees were very liberal in their thought process. 
They didn't believe in the resurrection, other things that the Pharisees believed in. And so what happens is as Paul is standing before this council, he realizes that he's got some Sadducees there and he's got some Pharisees there. So actually Paul brings up a point of discussion with them about the resurrection and now there's fussing and fighting going on between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So now they have turned their uh, 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 attention away from the Apostle Paul and why he's there, and they've turned it toward each other, and now they're bickering and fighting amongst each other about, you know, the belief of the resurrection and this, that, and the other. And that's why it says there in verse number 10 that when uh, the chief captain, fearing that Paul should be uh, pulled in pieces because of their fussing and fighting with each other, he pulls... Paul out of the way and he takes him and he puts him in prison and then we get verse 11 to where uh, the Lord comes to Paul that night and tells to him be of good cheer so as we look at this text can you imagine being jailed for the cause of Christ you know we're, we're living in a day and age that if we continue down the path that we are on you might be jailed for the cause of Christ amen what would you be thinking as you sat there in jail just because you served Christ? What would you be thinking? What would be your attitude, especially of those around you? Understand, Paul, as I've already mentioned, the greatest missionary that, have, that is one of the greatest that has walked this earth. Paul don't look at sitting in jail as a time of sorrow and trouble. He looks at it as his mission field. So he starts witnessing to people that are in jail, I'm sure. But anyway, we don't have to wonder how being in jail, how being arrested for the cause of Christ affected the Apostle Paul. For the majority of the rest of the book of Acts, the next uh, uh, five chapters, the next five chapters in the book of Acts, Paul was a prisoner. For all of that time, Paul was a prisoner. And during this time, while he was in prison, he actually wrote many of the books that we have uh, in our Bible. Or they're what we call the prison epistles that uh, Paul wrote. And he wrote those obviously while he was in prison. And by the way, even in prison, those books that we have that were written by him, they were also inspired by God. Amen? Amen. He, re he wrote those by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we call them, obviously, the prison epistles. Uh, but if I may, if, if I could take a little bit of time and uh, read some from uh, uh, an excerpt from some of these epistles on Paul's attitude while he was in jail. Uh, some statements that he made in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul says, there, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Paul himself makes that plain to the church at Ephesus. Hey, I'm, this is a prison epistle. Just to let you know, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. And listen, that's how Paul viewed himself. Paul viewed himself as a prisoner of the Lord. He wasn't a prisoner of the state. Amen? He considered himself as a prisoner of the Lord. He considered himself a prisoner for the cause of Christ and Paul counted that a privilege. He counted it a privilege to be called the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then also in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 20, he says, For which, now remember, he just got done saying that he was a prisoner of the Lord. And then he says in verse 20 of chapter 6, For which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Understand, an ambassador is a representative from a foreign land, and Paul considered himself a missionary to the other prisoners during this time, as well as those that he could write letters to. Listen, Paul didn't look down on himself and say, Woe is me, I'm always in prison and I didn't do nothing. No, Paul saw an Paul saw uh, a um, opportunity. To continue to spread the gospel to those that would hear. Amen. I, I am a prisoner. Therefore, I'm an ambassador. Listen, and because I'm an ambassador, I can speak boldly through the authority of who I represent. Understand, you and I, if we're saved, we represent the highest authority that ever exists. Jesus Christ is our authority, amen? And because Jesus Christ is our authority, and as long as we are speaking, thus saith the Lord, we can do it with boldness. 
We can do it with boldness. In other words, I like this. We can, like for example, you know, you could be at work and on Thursday morning, and you could tell your coworker, "Man, I'll tell you what, you should have been at church last night." And boy, the preacher had a good message, you know. And your coworker looks at you and goes, "You went to church on Wednesday night?" Then you can boldly look at him and say, "You don't." You know, with all authority and boldness because of who we are an ambassador for. Amen. I don't know of any power greater than the Lord Jesus Christ. None. And Paul understood that. Amen. Yes, Paul was in prison, but he wasn't a prisoner of the state. He was a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord for that. Man, what a jail ministry that the apostle Paul had. Listen, he was in jail and had that ministry. And then he says to the church in uh, uh, Philippi, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, he says, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Listen, yes, these things happened to me, but understand they happened so that the gospel could go forth, that it could continue to go. And verse 13 says, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. Listen, we, we, we saw on Wednesday, we see, we, we're, on Wednesday nights we're talking about the whole armor of God, and I used the uh, illustration. And imagine it as Paul, remember, and Ephesians is what we would call a prison epistle. That was a letter Paul wrote while he was in prison. And Paul, 24 hours, watch this. Uh, listen, just, just for doing what God wanted him to do, he had a guard posted beside him 24 hours a day. He had a guard with him. I made the comment Wednesday night, I, I, I could imagine those guards as they came in on shift. Oh, man, i got to be with the Apostle Paul. Man, I'm going to spend four hours listening to him talk about Jesus Christ. And I'm sure Paul used I mean, they couldn't leave. He had a captive audience, amen. And then I believe that as he sat there with that Roman soldier bound with him, he was looking at the garments, the, the, the armor that the Roman soldier had, and he penned what he wrote in Ephesians chapter 6 about the whole armor of God, amen. Paul was guarded, and now listen, by the infamous Praetorian Guard. The Praetorian Guard were the special forces, if you will, of that day. They were the elite soldiers who guarded Caesar himself. The average Christian could not have gotten close enough to witness to these people. So guess what? God did what he had to do in order to get his voice heard there. Praise the Lord. It's a, Paul understood it's all part of God's plan. And Paul's going to continue to work out God's plan. Amen? Amen. God gives each of us. Listen to me, Christian. God gives each of us inroads to share the gospel if we'll recognize them. Everywhere Paul went. Everywhere Paul went. Paul looked for an opportunity to get the gospel message to those that he had come into contact with. Remember when he went to Greece and he saw all these gods? I believe as Paul walked around, he looked for things that would help him uh, be a witness to those that he comes into contact with. And he looks at this one god, and you know, the names of the gods were on the statues, and he gets to this one statue, and it says, to the unknown god. And boy, when Paul saw that, a light bulb went off in his head. Ha! I know how I'm going to present the gospel message to this group. I'm going to tell them about this unknown God that they know nothing about. The God of all gods. Amen? By the way, let me just say, there's only one God. Amen. There ain't no other gods. Man might think there is, but they ain't. So, ain't ain't a word? Yeah, that's all right. Connie knew what I meant. <laughs> but understand that God gives each of us inroads, inroads to share the gospel. Every opportunity we have, God gives us the inroads, gives us the ability to understand that this meeting that I had with this individual was not by accident. Amen? There's a reason. So did it work for Paul? Philippians chapter 4 and verse 22 says, All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of, watch this, Caesar's household. He said, the saints salute you, 
those that are of Caesar's household. So yeah, Paul took advantage of what God gave him and it worked. Amen? Listen, the next time you're placed in circumstances that were not your first choice, look for a door of opportunity to be opened by God. He has a reason for everything, even your doctor's appointment. Listen, even running an hour late. Amen? I'm not saying that for you to be late all the time, but sometimes there are reasons that you run late. Amen? Uh, your septic tank needing pumped. Talked about that yesterday. That's not a requirement anymore, by the way, thank goodness. I hope that's right, Sam. Listen, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Paul says, listen, you might bound me, but guess what? The words of God you can't bound. No matter where I go, no matter who I come in contact with, I'm going to share the gospel message to them. Paul knew that though they could not bind the man, they, or though they could bind the man, they could not bind the message. In our text, it's his first night in jail as we pick it up here uh, in chapter 23 and verse 11. It's his first night in jail. This is before he wrote all these other verses that we've just looked at. So what is Paul thinking? How did he get a good perspective early on? Amen? Paul was a great man, no doubt about it. But he was still just a man. Dr. Yoho said, uh, when I went to college, he said, the best of man is man at best. That's all we are. Paul had real feelings and needed God to be with him and to be real to him. That's why a lot of times when I pray for you, I, I ask, Lord, make yourself seem so real to that person. God wants to be real to us. Amen. God is real. Jesus is real. And we have feelings and uh, we need God to be with us. We need God to be real with us. Uh, Paul needed to know that he wasn't alone. How many times y'all feel alone? Listen, there are times we do feel alone. Listen, but understand God is there. Amen? Then God showed up in his cell just when Paul needed God most. Listen, three things that I want to look at that happened in the jail that night. As we look at this text, and I pray that it encourages you. I don't know what you're going through. Some of you might just feel you're alone all the time. But listen, this message is to encourage you. And listen, this message is also for those that don't think of other people. We need to think of other people. We need to... Th listen, there are... Uh, we've got some ladies in our church that do live alone and i'm not going to say any more than that being online but if we don't reach out to them if we listen i'll be i don't know how they can stay at home and nobody else in the house to talk to <laughs> maybe they want a phone call from somebody maybe they just want to talk to somebody maybe they got something they want to get off their chest like we do listen do we think about others do we think about them we need to reach out to them and let them know hey we care about you amen so three things I want us to see that happened in the jail that night. And we're only going to look at verse 11. Not saying we're going to mention other verses, but we're going to look at verse 11 in our text. So y'all got verse 11 there? Okay, the first thing that I want us to see, number one, is that the Lord stood by Paul. The Lord stood by Paul. Now, I could probably stop here, and I'm going to give y'all some maybe some homework if you want to. But there were, are some that would say that Paul was not in God's will. Because if you go just a couple of chapters over in chapters 21, you'll see that it might look like that the Holy Spirit is trying to keep Paul from going to Jerusalem. And Paul says, I'm going to go anyway. But there are some people that say, see, Paul, Paul didn't listen. He, he ignored the Holy Spirit. There, let y'all do your own homework on that. I don't believe that's true. Amen. Because if it was true, Jesus wouldn't be with Paul right now in verse number 11. Amen. Verse number 11. Look, and the night following, what does it say? The Lord stood by him. But what a beautiful phrase that is. What a beautiful phrase. 
Listen, we're big on commitment, amen, and we should be. Yeah, uh, amen, commitment is a good thing. Amen. And making commitments, and not only making commitments, but keeping commitments. But let's not forget that when we make a commitment to Jesus, he also makes a commitment to us. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6, he had said, I will never what? Leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. A woman said to D.L. Moody, I have found a great promise to help me when I'm afraid. And I've used this in, in uh, other messages. But a uh, woman came to Moody and said, I found a great promise to help me when I'm afraid. Psalm 56, 3, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Moody replied, I've got a better promise than that. And Isaiah 12, 2, it says, behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. Both when we're afraid and even when we're not, both of those promises are true, aren't they? Both of those promises are true. The Lord stood by Paul first as the sympathizing Christ. Just a few years earlier, Jesus was in the same city, amen, before the same council as Paul was, amen, also being tried for things which are no crime, but for uh, doing good. Jesus had been there and he had done that. He's been in the same place that the apostle Paul was in. Jesus stood before the same council. Jesus was still uh, uh, convicted of doing good. Amen. Falsely accused. Both were called blasphemers. Both were called heretics. Both were called troublemakers. And we have a Savior who knows and understands what we're going through. Because why? He has been there. He's right here with us today. Amen. Are you lonely? Are you hurting? Are you feeling rejected? Are you grieving? Are you discouraged? Hey, Jesus has been there. And he's with you right now. The Lord, the Lord stood by Paul as the sympathizing Christ. He also stood by Paul as the sustaining Christ. We need others to hold us up sometimes. We do. We need each other. And that's important, Christian. We need each other. S tragedies and trials are so great that we cannot even attempt to make it on our own. And either somebody swoops in to help sustain us, or we're going to go down. We need each other. There's no doubt about it. And I wish, that's one thing we, we need to get into our minds, is that we do need each other. We need to step outside of what we got going on and think about somebody else. Amen? Amen! How wonderful to know that when we can't stand, that Jesus stands by us. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now we know in context, Paul said those words, because he prayed to the Lord three times to ask to remove the thorns that were in his side. But God said, Paul, hey, hey. My grace is sufficient for you. Hey, understand this morning, Christian, that no matter what you're going through, hey, God's grace is sufficient for you. God's grace is sufficient for you, praise the Lord. Amen. Compassion begins when we start to think and understand what others are going through. And we have a Savior who doesn't just know what we're going through because He's omniscient, but because he himself has gone through it too. And you know what? He's got sustaining grace to get us through it. Then Paul wrote in Philippians 4.19, some of y'all might know these words by memory, and it's a good thing to, to memorize scripture, but my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. My God. Amen. My God shall supply. God understands your problems. He does. And they are as unique and special 
and painful to him. Thank God he has an endless supply to take and fill every need in the most perfect way possible. Woo! Are y'all still with me this morning? One down, two to go. The Lord stood by Paul, right? How? Sympathizing and sustaining him. Number two, the next thing we see, that the Lord spoke to Paul. The Lord spoke to him. Verse 11. In the night following, the Lord stood by him and said. So the Lord speaking to Paul. What a blessing to have a God who speaks to us. You know, I remember when um, Pence, vice president, said that the Lord spoke to him and he spoke to the Lord. How the media made fun of him because of that. They just don't understand, do they? Throughout history, the Lord has spoken to his people. Throughout history. Whether he spoke audibly through a bush, or whether he spoke on a wall or across the sky, or by means of ink on paper, or the Holy Spirit in the heart, he speaks and he speaks often. Hebrews chapter 1, we all know that. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers, but by, uh, by the prophets, verse 2 says, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. And today he speaks to us how? Through his word. Through his word and the Holy Spirit in our hearts. He speaks to us. So what does he speak to the Apostle Paul? He speaks a message of cheer. And we can learn from that, y'all. He says to Paul in verse 11 again, be of good cheer. Where's Paul at right now? He's in jail. He's in prison. And here's Jesus standing beside him. And he says, Paul, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. In other words, Jesus is saying to the apostle Paul, Paul, take courage. Take courage. Jesus said it many times during Paul's earthly ministry and during his ministry. Jesus himself told many people to take courage. To the man sick with the palsy, to the woman with the blood disease, even during the storms to his disciples. Be of good cheer. Paul gets, uh, Jesus gives words of encouragement. And he does the same in our hearts. He does the same through our preaching or encourager in the church or in private devotions as just the right message leaps off the page. How many of y'all have ever been reading the Bible and doing your devotions? And boy, Jesus shows you something. And how your heart just fills with joy and says, Woo! Lord, thank you for sharing that with me. Listen, sometimes I preach hard messages, and believe it or not, I worry about how some of the facts might be received or not received. I try to be encouraging, but sometimes what God tells me to say doesn't seem too encouraging. And there are times that I myself feel discouraged, wondering how a message was received. Then I hear you, the congregation, testifying and, and telling me how, how much you appreciate the plain truth spoken without apology and compromise. Listen, that's a huge blessing to me. That encourages me. And I, who always wants to be encouraging, ends up being the encouraged. Just simply because of what you say. You know, and it really does my heart good to know that you want the truth of God's word without apology. That you just don't want to be told that you're good. That you don't want to just have your ears tickled. Listen, when we come to church, we ought to come to church ready to feel uncomfortable. Amen? Amen. How many of you know of someone right now that could use a card of encouragement? This is where I pause for dramatic effect. How many of y'all know somebody that could use a card of encouragement? Well, let me encourage you to take time to do it. Take time to do it. Man, you don't know what a blessing it is to just get a card out of the blue that somebody's thinking about me. Man, that encourages people. And I, listen, we need to do that more, amen? People love encouraging. There are people that do. People love encouraging. People love uplifting. They love positive people. Sometimes they dread seeing a negative person even enter the room. Listen, a pat on the back. Let me, let me share this with you. A pat on the back is just as valuable as a kick in the pants. Yep, yeah, sure is. 
A boxing coach tried to believe in all of his students, but he had one student who got his bell rang all the time. He always thought the round was over because of the bells that he heard after getting knocked around in the ring. He got knocked around in every way imaginable. One round, he came to his corner and the coach said, Man, great job. He never laid a glove on you. Now get back out there and finish him off. Okay, coach, said the boxer. Next round ended, the same result. The next round, same result. The next round, he was almost knocked out. But he was saved by the bell. Back in his corner, the coach was the same kind of encourager. Coach, uh, coach said, come on, you got it now. He never laid a glove on you. Man, you've got this round. You can get him. The boxer said, coach, I'll go back out there. But would you keep an eye on the referee? Because somebody's beating the tar out of me. <laughs> Listen, though, but man, he tried to be an encourager. Amen. We need some encouragers in our churches today. Encouragement can make us do a lot more, and it can make us keep going, can't it? Amen. And at its very best, and it's at its very best just when we need it the most. Amen. We all need, your pastor needs encouragement at times. Each and every one of us do, and we've got to be aware of that. I'm glad Jesus knows it. That's why he gave Paul the message of cheer, didn't he? What, else, what other message did he give? He gave a message of commendation. He sure did. Look at that. He said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem. That's what he said, isn't it? That's a message of what? Commendation. In other words, Jesus said to Paul, congratulations, you've testified of me in Jerusalem. Congratulations on that. Hey, thank you for doing what I asked you to do. We don't know of anyone who got saved because of Paul's ministry this time in Jerusalem. It looks honestly like he failed from a human perspective. But you know what? The Lord said, hey, Paul, good job for being a witness. Good job for being a witness. This tells us two things about our witnessing. When we witness, God notices and he appreciates it. Praise the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> and someday standing before God, he will personally thank us and reward us for it. So one of the things that we need to understand about our witnessing is that God notices it and he appreciates it. Number two, and I've said this before and I'll keep saying it. When we witness, God doesn't require us to be successful, only faithful. You could witness to a hundred people and not one get saved. And you know what? God's going to be thankful that you witness to them. It's not your responsibility to save anybody. It's not. Just be a witness. It's all you got to be. Just be a witness. Amen. You know, you got people out there to think if I witness to somebody and they don't get saved that they failed. But they didn't fail. If I'm out witnessing to somebody and I'm telling them about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and how they can inherit eternal life in His name and forever live in heaven and they don't get saved, guess what? It's not my fault. It's their fault. You don't fail if you are a witness for God. You do your part and be a witness. You're not a failure. They're the failure because they rejected Jesus. Amen? Now, if you don't go out and witness, you're a failure. But Paul here, Jesus commended the Apostle Paul. Hey, Paul, man, good job. Thanks for being a witness. Listen, that's how many of y'all like to get told you did a good job? Yeah. Y'all did a great job yesterday. I, man, that's what, what would you? I don't, I don't know what you're thinking. What if you came in this morning and I didn't mention anything at all about yesterday? You know, I'm, I, listen, I, I, I'm just a person, but I'm very appreciative of what y'all did. I really am. Y'all did a great job. Thank you. Commendation's good, is it not? And one day we're going to be commended by the Lord Jesus Christ if we're faithful and obedient to him. Understand that when we witness, Scripture tells us one plants, one waters. And I should make sure, listen, that as you are witnessing, you don't burn any bridges 
but you set that individual up for the next witness that comes along. They might not get saved with your witness, but you're just pouring water on a seed that somebody else has planted, and you don't want to kill it by being mean to the individual. You don't want to burn any bridges because, hey, around the corner, God's got somebody left off to the side that's going to continue to witness to them, and you don't want to put a bad taste in their mouth about Christians. Amen? We have to leave the results into God's hands. He's the one who gives the increase. <clears throat> Listen, in an invitation, then when you give to somebody, you have to remember that you don't have to produce fruit every single time when you witness. God considers faithfulness as fruit and also promises that if we consistently give the message faithfully, he will doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Amen. D.L. Moody, I'm going to use a quote of his again. D.L. Moody was approached by a drunk who introduced himself saying, ha <laughs> ha. I'm one of your converts. D.L. Moody looked at him and he said, Well, you must be one of my converts because you're certainly not one of the Lord's. Some things to think about. I've been out on visitation with people that forces them to get saved. You know these people that you just hound them so much that they'll just say a profession of faith so you'll just get out of there and leave them alone? Listen, that's not real. That's not real. Listen, the Lord spoke to the Apostle Paul a message of what? Of cheer. He spoke a message of commendation. And he also spoke a message of confidence. End of verse 11, what does he say? Thank you for being a witness to me in Jerusalem. But guess what? You're going to be a witness to me in Rome. So Paul knows that he's going to survive whatever happens in Jerusalem. He's going to get to go to Rome and witness to Caesar. Amen. That's what he's wanted all along. That's what Paul wanted all along. And, and, and was starting to wonder if he'd ever get that privilege. But now Jesus put all of his doubts to rest, didn't he? God has said it, and that settles it. It used to be, how does it go? God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. No, that's not the true saying. The true saying is God said it, and that settles it. Whether we believe it or not, it's settled. All right, so just when he needed it the most, the Lord stood by Paul. Just when he needed it most, the Lord spoke to Paul. Lastly, and we're, we're done with this, the Lord secured Paul. The Lord secured Paul. Now for this, we do got to go to verse 12 and read down to verse 14. Because I want you to see what happens. Understand, Paul is in prison. And the religious leaders of that day, just like they wanted to get rid of Jesus, they wanted to get rid of Paul too. They wanted to get rid of Paul. Look at verse 12. And when it was day, okay, so we have the night there in verse 11 that the Lord appeared unto Paul. Verse 12, we pick it up. It's daytime. Certain of the Jews banded together, bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until what? They had killed Paul. Paul's in prison. And they still want to kill him. Just like they wanted to kill Jesus Christ. So Paul's in prison. Unbeknownst to him, there are Jews that are getting together to plot his murder. They're plotting his murder. Look at verse 13. Guess how many were there? Forty. More than forty. And they were... More than 40 which had made this conspiracy. Think about that, Sam. More than 40 people wanting him dead. Verse 14. They came to the chief, chief priests, the elders, and said, Listen, we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Understand that in these verses, these 40 men, they enter into a death pact together against Paul. The Lord had said to Paul the previous night, what? You're going to go to Rome. You're going to Rome. But these 40 say, nah, Paul, you ain't going anywhere. Hmm, Tammy, I wonder who's going to win this one. <laughs> Jesus says, Paul, you're going to Rome. These 40 men say, hey, we're going to kill you, Paul. You're dead. We're going to, we're going to, you read the rest of those verses. They try to come up with a plan to get Paul out of prison and by himself. They try to come up with a scheme to get Paul by himself. 
It's amazing how God works, amen? You know there's not one more mention of God in this passage, and yet you can see his hand at work on Paul throughout the rest of this chapter. And God worked in a way that Paul never imagined. Kind of like the book of Esther. How many times does the word God appear in Esther? None. You know, when the, uh, the council, our, our founding fathers were putting the Bible together, they were wondering if they should leave Esther out because God's not mentioned in Esther. They, you know, that was a discussion they had. Should we, should we make Esther part of the cano canonical scriptures? And because you can see the providence of God throughout that book, they, they included it into the canon of scripture, which we have today. But God will work in ways that we can't imagine. Now, how did God handle this? Did God smite these 40 men with leprosy? Did he, uh, did he, did he smite them with blindness? Or did he uh, allow the earth to open up and swallow them or uh, have a fiery hole in the earth? No, it wasn't nothing dramatic. Guess, guess what God used to, to deliver Paul? A little boy. He used a little boy to deliver Paul out of this death conspiracy. Amen? <laughs> Look at verse 16. And when Paul's sister's son, Paul had a sister, so he's got a nephew, so it was his nephew, heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle, and he told Paul what was going on. God used a little boy to help Paul accomplish what God wanted him to do. So now, how, no matter how small and insignificant you think you are, God can use you. God can use you. Look, verse 17, And Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he has certain thing to tell him. So it goes on that uh, the 40 men, they huddled together conspiring, and they wouldn't worry about this little boy who uh, overheard them. And uh, this little boy, as we found out in verse 16, was none other than Paul's nephew, and he got word to the right people to help Paul. Look at verse 23. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesar, and horsemen threescore and ten, and spearmen two hundred at the third hour of the night, and provide them beasts that they may what? Set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. So this little boy went to Paul. Paul called the chief captain and said, Hey, take this boy to whoever he needs to go. Tell him what, tell the boy, tell them what he heard. And so you know what? To protect Paul, they pretty much got an army to surround the apostle Paul as he left that jail so that those 40 men couldn't do nothing. Amen? A 470-member posse was put together and all because of one little boy eavesdropping. You may be going through circumstances. Listen to me. Listen to me. You may be going through circumstances in which you don't see if God is anywhere around. But listen, don't doubt for one second that he ain't there. Don't do it. God is standing somewhere in the shadows. If he's not standing by you, he's standing there. Amen? Amen. I've used this illustration before, but I, I think it fits here. Just after World War II, American soldiers found a little cellar where Jews had hid out. And written on the wall, one had written, I believe in the sun even when it doesn't shine. I believe in love even when it's not shown. And I believe in God even when I cannot see him work. Listen, is that kind of faith that you and I have? Listen, trust this. God is present. And God is at work through all of your circumstances. I don't care. You name whatever circumstance it might be. We can't control the circumstances around us. But hey, rest assured that no matter what circumstance you are going through, God is going to be there just when you need him. Just when you need him, God is going to be there. Do you trust him? Let's stand and pray. Sister Arlene, if you'll get ready. Listen, are you trusting God? That's the key. Are you trusting God? Listen, the Apostle Paul in jail, God stood with Paul. God had a message for Paul. God gave confidence to the Apostle Paul. Listen, his head's bowed, eyes are closed. Let me ask you this morning, hey, are you saved? Hey, do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? If not, you're going to die and go to hell. Listen, that's scripture. You'll die and go to hell without Jesus Christ. Trust in him this morning. 
Listen, he loves you. He loved you so much he gave his life for you. But God commanded his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Are you saved this morning? Do you know you'll go to heaven when you die? Listen, if not, you can. Praise the Lord, there's still hope. If you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, listen, he might be knocking at your heart's door right now as we speak. He might be knocking at your heart's door saying, let me in. Let me come in and be the Lord of your life and give you eternal life. Listen, the moment you get saved, you exchange all of your ugly, dirty sin for his pure, clean righteousness. Listen, trust Jesus. Call upon him while there's time. Today is the day of salvation. Do you know you'll go to heaven when you die? If not, would you raise your hand? And raising your hand, you're just saying, preacher, pray for me. I don't know if I'll go to heaven when I die, but boy, I'd like to. Listen, I, if there's one thing that this preacher wishes that he could get across into the hearts of everybody that can hear him is the fact that hell is a real place. And if you reject Jesus Christ as your Savior, that is a place where you're going to spend eternity. Listen, this ain't no joke. This ain't no game we're playing. God created us to live eternally and to have you put your trust in him. If you don't, you're going to spend eternity in a lake of fire. Well, I don't understand these people that say they love their parents, they love their, their uh, children, they love their grandchildren, but yet don't have them in church and they don't tell them about the things of God. Listen, if you truly love somebody, you're going to be concerned about their spiritual life because your loved ones are going to spend eternity somewhere. Let me encourage you. Start with yourself if you're not saved. Bow your heart before the Lord Jesus Christ and confess you're a sinner. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and invite him into your heart. Christian, listen, we need to be of an encourager to one another. Listen, life don't revolve around us. We need to step out of ourselves and we need to think of others. And we need to reach out more to each other and help encourage them. Yes, Jesus can do it, but you know what? He can use you to do it. Are you being a witness to those at work, to those you come into contact with? Are you being obedient to share a gospel message? Maybe just to hand them a gospel tract so that they can get saved. We're going to open up this altar. We're going to pray and sing a song. You come and do what the Lord wants. Father, thank you. Thank you for the illustration we have in Scripture of you standing beside the Apostle Paul just when he needed you most. Father, I pray that you will help us as New Hope Baptist Church, that first and foremost we would be a witness of the gospel message that Jesus saves. And Lord, that we would proclaim it wherever we go. And then, Lord, when circumstances and things come and change our lives, and Father, we don't know if we're going to make it through this day. Thank you for the promise that we have that you'll stand with us. You'll give us words of encouragement, words of, con of commendation. And Father, I pray that you'll be with the individual that doesn't know if they'll go to heaven when they die. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would work on their hearts. And Father, I pray that they would come to know you before it's eternally too late. Bless this invitation, for it's in Jesus' name we ask it all, and amen. We'll sing uh, hymn number 306, Just As I Am. We might change that up sometime. If God's speaking to you, listen, the altar's open. Just as I am without one plea, but that I shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee O Lamb of God I come I come just as So... Oh. 
Lord, blot to Thee, whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Amen. All minds and hearts clear. Well, amen. Amen, sister. Amen. Amen. I like that. And a lot of people don't just, you know, they, why do you make people come? We don't make anybody come to the altar. Listen, you, you, you make that decision on your own. That's between you and God. But some people, yeah. Yeah, and you know, and a lot of people also think, well, if I go up there, they're going to think the preacher was talking to me. Listen, what you talk to God about up here might not even have nothing to do with the message. Amen. God could deal with your heart about anything, and shame on us for thinking otherwise. Amen. Listen, there ain't nothing wrong with coming to the altar. Amen. Praise the Lord. Old-fashioned altar. That's right. Praise God. Old-fashioned. Amen. It's good to have you. you how many of y'all going to go home and take a nap now? <laughs> Amen. Spoken like a true Baptist. Amen. But let me encourage you as you leave here this morning, listen, consider others. Think about others throughout the week. Amen. Think about others. And don't forget on the uh, foyer out there, if you want a copy of the book, uh, The Minor Prophets by Charles Feinberg, uh, please put your name on there. And then uh, pray about if the Lord, you know, what the Lord would have you to do concerning the hymnals. Um, that uh, we're looking. We're making just a few changes here at the church, and I think changes are good. Oh, and by the way, church, just so you know this, I know we don't have to vote on it or anything, but just so you know this, I'm actually doing it to embarrass somebody. But Brother Sam is in charge of all the electrical stuff here. So that's all I'm going to say. And he's, he's got... He, and he's already got some ideas of some things to do. So, listen, let me encourage you. If you got a question about the elect, now, uh, Randy's our electronics. If you got any questions about electric, you go to Brother Sam. Man, construction is dull. Say, the Lord's bringing people here. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, and I appreciate each and every one of you, and I love you, and I want to thank you for being here. Come back tonight at 6, be a part of the service. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Bill, if you would, dismiss us with a word of prayer.